Hello. Um, getting things done generally requires people to get things done, and the science that I think it involves is psychology. And we haven't actually talked about mm. getting teams to work together because mm. we've got uh, nutcase entrepreneurs trying to work with scientists, we've got designers who have very strong views, we have engineers who will all be disagreeing with each other, and actually there's a science of not getting things done if you don't get the team working mm. together. So generally speaking, how would the panel make sure that they had people getting things done together and as a team. Thank you very much. The psychological aspects, how do we get things done as a team? What, what are the key things that we look for, uh, that we insist upon, perhaps? Any, uh... I, I, I'll kick off. Um, I think one of the, the key things for us in terms of developing a team that will be um, effective sorry to use the word, uh, and deliver and get stuff done, is its ability to collaborate. And I think we can see in the people that we work with whether they show collaborative behaviours, whether they're willing to work with others, whether they're willing to listen to other people's opinions and to take them on board, whether they're willing to uh, work in a, in a space where you share ideas and you share, share tasks. Uh, but, and also uh, be prepared to accept the decision made by the team, which you might not agree with. So I think for us, the ability of a team to be, um, to be able to deliver and get stuff done is manifested in its ability to collaborate. And that, I think, is the, the, sk the skills that we see in both the members of the team and the team, lead and the team leadership. If the leaders are in able to instill a spirit of collaboration within the team and that thing of a, you know, the common goal that we're going to deliver, all going to deliver the common goal together, uh, I think that's really important. Uh, and people who are not collaborative, I think, don't last very long. Anyone else on? Yeah, um, the tension that you're describing for us uh, mainly exists between our team and our clients because they come from a different perspective, like you described. Um, and it sounds a bit uh, simple, but the only uh, remedy that I know is communication because the default state is misunderstandings. Uh, that's what you can expect to happen unless you, uh, you know, limit the damage by talking it over over and over and over again, um, and, uh, and not assuming that somebody understood what you actually first said. And maybe that's, like you said, uh, something that um, automated systems or AI or um, data or intelli artificial intelligence cannot do for us in the, in the foreseeable future, that kind of negotiation and that uh, kind of liaison between um, different uh, kinds of human perception. And that's where we kind of, um, where we're still need it, I hope, in the long run. <laughs> yes. We hope, we hope. Anything to add or we, we move on? So, yeah, so, so for me, it's all, it's all around um, the work being meaningful to the team and the team feeling that they, they have the ability to exploit their talents to get it done. It's, it's the, if you can set up that as, a, as an environment, uh, then you've got a much better chance, I think, of, of, uh, of, of people great. being highly motivated. You know. Yeah, I, th I think the only thing I'd add is, you know, to echo something Pete said, um, you know, a lot of what we've been talking about to today is about using technology to kind of scale impact, you know, effectively, efficiently, th those words. But actually, in a way, leadership, you know, leadership is a scaling technology mm. in that it allows <laughs> someone yeah. to, you know, take a set of ideas, a, a vision, a, a goal, a way of doing things, mm. and actually expand that far beyond themselves. And uh, you know, again, to think on what will be the last thing to go, I actually think leadership is, is, is <laughs> got to gotta be the answer to that. Fantastic. Thank you. And Matt's been very quotable. Leadership is a scaling technology. You could tweet <laughs> that if your phones went off. We had um, a gentleman at the front here. If you wait uh, for the microphone. Oh, yes. Okay, we'll go here and then here. And um, thank you for your patience. Okay, uh, Rick Parker. Uh, you couldn't sit here in these hallowed halls with their uh, history back in the end of the 18th century and even reflecting before that to the scientists and people of the 17th century and uh, Newton and uh, Leonardo da Vinci, without reflecting on the fact that in those days, the science, the art, the magic, the alchemy, the engineering were all a, a continuum. Yeah. Those mm -hmm. people dabbled yeah. in all of them. They didn't draw these clear distinctions. So uh, two questions, really. One, do you think 
today's society is way too stovepiped in, in boxing people as engineers, scientists, artists, to actually get the best out of people. And secondly, you all made this process of getting things done sound incredibly analytical, whether analytical from an artistic viewpoint or analytical from a scientific viewpoint. Is there no room for magic, for happenstance, for luck in the process of getting things done? Thank you very much. So are we living in boxes too much? And is there room for magic outside our boxes? No one like to... I mean, really, I, uh, something we sort of touched on, but, you know, magic is maybe just a word for the things that we don't really understand yet, how they, how they work. And I actually think that the best engineers and the best scientists do operate um, you know, somewhat at the level of magic, as in they're, they're, they're interested in the things that we can't yet explain. And, but I do agree that, you know, someone, someone already said, you know, the machine doesn't ask the questions yet. Um, and I think that often what we see is the most interesting ideas come from people who have had at least an... In we mainly work with scientists, with engineers, but have had an injection of the humanities of the arts into their, into their background and training because it changes the questions that they, that they ask. And you know, because we select individuals before they have a company, before they have a team, we literally throw 100 people into a room together for six months. It's the bouncing off of, of those people around each other on the unexpected connections, which maybe you can call a little bit of magic, partly because we don't understand them. Um, <laughs> I think that's where the special stuff happens. Um, I, I talked briefly about values earlier um, and, and like different perspectives and, and values that you put your focus on. And um, for us, um, or for me personally and my business partner, the, um, our company has always been uh, primarily a vehicle for um, making us happy. Um, so a lot more chance and a lot more magic uh, in there, you know, that you actually see it as um, a very, very primary target to be happy to come into work every day um, and have all other metrics um, way, way behind uh, that, that first goal. Um, so I, I think um, allowing for chance to, um, you know, and acknowledging that it is, um, that randomness is a part of the process, um, I think is really important also in a business context. Peter, sorry, sorry for a bit here. No, go on. Yeah, I mean, surely there has to be space for a bit of magic, doesn't there? <laughs> otherwise, what's the point otherwise? So, so, uh, so yeah, certainly I think there, there, there has to be. We probably are um, a bit stovepiped in, in the way that we, we see things. But uh, call me sad, but, you know, I see beauty in, in, in beautifully engineered um, things that maybe have, you know, we've, you've arrived at the shape through... Uh, you know, lots of data and that sort of stuff, but some of it's beautiful, and I think, you know, it's. Uh, I think I think engines are a work of art, but it's just because I'm sad. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think there's a lot of sad people here in that case. Isn't <laughs> I, I, I think there is a danger in us becoming siloed, stovepiped, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but I'm absolutely convinced that the the greatest bits of okay, I've come from an infrastructure world. The greatest bits of infrastructure come from teams that are diverse in their thinking. Yeah. So the team the team that includes architects, engineers, scientists, psychologists, and builders and the client produce a much better quality product than if you get something that is just designed by a bunch of engineers yeah. or just designed <laughs> by a bunch of architects. So I'm I'm. Uh, totally in favour of completely mixed teams that include as many, a wider range of capabilities and a wider range of, of, of thinking as possible. Uh, to do otherwise just ends up with, you know, unidimensional uh, thinking. And that's not going to get anyone here. And the magic. Uh, I think the, you know, when a, when a team clicks, you know, in, in the building world, when, when the crack is good, then it is magic. Um, when the click team doesn't click, it can be a desperate place to be. So the, the magic for me is in um, a project that is delivered really well, everybody enjoys it, everybody has a smile on their face, and at the end of the day, the client is really happy with, happy with what we produced. And then, every, you know, if everybody comes away from it, having feeling satisfied and got what they wanted, then that is, that is magic. Fantastic. So it's a great answer to a great question. And I'll venture a sort of final observation, I suppose, just on this, that we know talking here about collaboration, about communication, about purpose, about empathy, about, you know, these sort of wonderfully rich human factors. And it is it's perhaps an occasional irony that these things which are going to make people most robust 
in an increasingly technologized world and most employable and successful are perhaps not always the skills and the attributes taught or honed by the way a lot of people use technology today, that the way we use a lot of tools isn't necessarily uh, geared up to, to bring out these psychological riches. I have a, a question from in the gods, so oh, if I can ask for that and then we will go over here. Thank you, yes, this is God speaking. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, Tom, Paul, Paul uh, said something right at the beginning which I found very interesting, which was that you should create a winning culture, uh, which I think sounds terrific. Now, suppose, Paul, I mean, you come from one of our outstanding engineering companies, clearly. Matthew gives you a small engineering company, and you have to create a winning culture. How do you set about it? Sorry, can you repeat that? How do you create a winning culture in the company you've just been given? Goodness me. Well, I hope you're paying for it. <laughs> <laughs> you've just purchased at an excellent price. Absolutely. Well, it's always very funny. In a, a large company has many cultures, and um, but I think the mark of a, of a mature um, company is one that, that can accept uh, a, a slightly a different culture in a, in a way that doesn't stifle it. So um, we, we actually find that quite, quite difficult. There's quite a strong culture in Rolls-Royce of, as you might imagine, quality and thoroughness and these sorts of things. So if you deviate from that, it's, it's evil. Um, so actually learning how to not control everything and deliberately putting ourselves... We do lots of joint ventures where we're not fully in control of something mm -hmm. because we, knew, we know that if we were, we would just make it look like ourselves and actually we want it to be different. So I think there's a self-restraint required in order to, to allow something to be... If you, presumably, if you've, if, you've, if you've decided you want it, you've decided there's something about it that's winning already. So how do you not break <laughs> what, uh, what you value? You know? Fantastic. Um, and I'm, I'm turning my chair this way so I can observe this half the room. And yes, we have a question here. So I have a very simple question. Are we getting too many things done? So <laughs> what I am observing over the last decade, I'd say, is an increasing uh, importance, in increasing emphasis on agility, the moment, try and error. Academics even talk about the advent of autocracy. So everything collapses into the moment, nothing else counts. While my grandpa left me with one Latin proverb, quid quid agis, agas prudenta et respica finem, which translates into whatever you do, act prudently and consider the ending. So where would you position yourself on that scale? Thank you very much. We've got some Latin. We are truly in the Royal Institution. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in Latin, I would invite our panel. No, this is a fantastic question. Are we getting too many things done? Where do we come down on the scale of acting prudently, reflecting? I mean, I, I haven't even been in business for a decade, but um, I, um, I see the, um, what you're saying about um, um, short-term goals, I guess, is something that has become the primary focus. And I think that metrics and, and data uh, are actually playing a big part in that because, again, we're holding on to the things that we can measure rather than, um, which might have been more the case 100 years ago, um, it was more about um, how somebody was feeling about something and where they wanted to take things and the opportunities that they had along the way um, with a bit more magic involved and um, more randomness taking, taking space. And, um, and I think Maybe we are trying to get too many things done because we're trying to control too many things. I think there's... The, the, you're going to no, say no, you're, you're good. <laughs> Please. I, I think there is, there's an, there is an, I, I kind of agree and disagree. I think, I think there is an element of short-termism in people's views about, about making investments or trying to or, or creating uh, creating new space, creating new things in cities, for example. But the pace of technology is changing so rapidly that you almost have to say that a lot of the stuff that we are doing are we almost taking too longer term view because technology is changing so quickly. Mm -hmm. So, for example, here in the UK. If you're driving up and down motorways, you can see that we're installing all these smart motorway stuff. There's gantries going up that tell you what speed limit to drive at. 
I think in like 10 years' time, it's going to be completely redundant because the, your car will decide how fast it should be going. It won't be a gantry telling you, the driver, how fast to go. So I think in some respects, we, make, we are making long-term decisions when we shouldn't be making long-term decisions. And I think in other times, we are not investing for the future because we're wanting a short-term gain. So I think it's halfway between the two. Mm -hmm. At times we need to take a longer term view and at other times we need to take a much shorter term view. But, but basically we are doing it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got it all wrong. Is, we need more engineers in government. Absolutely. This is the verdict yes. of the panel. Yeah. Yeah. My, my observation is we might be getting a lot done, but it, it doesn't feel like the world is a place short of things yet to be done. <laughs> you know? So, uh, no, I think, I think um, we're not getting enough done. I think it's also, a, you know, it's something that comes up a lot where, you know, kind of the startup world has been revolutionised over the last 15 years by this idea of iteration that you kind of touched on. Um, and a lot of people say, well, that's all very well and good, but how do you combine vision and iteration? They feel like they're in tension. Um, I actually don't think they're in tension, but I think, again, kind of part of the reason they feel like they're in tension is a lot of myth-making around entrepreneurial vision. So, again, I think, you know, to use our Steve Jobs uh, story, we kind of imagine that Steve Jobs closed his eyes, saw the iPhone, and then went out and, you know, kind of implemented the iPhone. Whereas, actually, I don't know who remembers the first version of the iPhone, but there wasn't an app store. Um, you know, many of the features that we associate with being most iPhone-like today just didn't exist on it. And I, I think what I would think of as a vision is, a vision is, you know, a North Star. It's kind of the way that you, it's what you move towards, but in moving towards it, you're going to acquire skills and capabilities and resources and ideas and relationships and networks that allow you to move the vision a little bit, hopefully in a direction that's better for some definition of the word better. Um, yeah. and, and then you'll go there again and again, you'll acquire new skills and capabilities, etc. And so I think vision is really important, even in a world of iteration, but we, I think we shouldn't pretend that the great entrepreneurial visions of the past have actually been static. I think they've always been dynamic and always iterated. Thank you very much. And um, we have another a question over here. Uh, you got yeah, a microphone. As, as human, we like making decisions, but we actually know that we often make the wrong decisions because whatever is at the front of our mind is the decision we make. But it can be very well be wrong either economically or whatever. How do we get people to trust in AI that that's making the wrong decision when it goes against what the decision is that we think we should make? Thank you very much. So I think we have a question, in a sense, uh, based on the availability heuristic, that people, people take whatever is right in front of them or whatever they immediately remember, and they act on that. And we're going to be lucky enough to have AIs that are much less vulnerable to that particular bias than us but how are we going to get people to listen to these wise AIs? How do we persuade people to stop taking decisions for goodness sake because they take the wrong or bad decisions? Or should we do this? Is this a correct diagnosis? I think this is the, 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 the trust thing, isn't there? So I'm interested in the debate that's going on around autonomous vehicles at the moment. So... Um, you know, the argument against autonomous vehicles is, well, how can, what will happen in a, an accident? And how can I be assured that this, will never, this car will never, ever, ever have an accident? But, well, hang on, that's going to be... But your autonomous vehicle is still going to be way, way, way safer than a human. And a human is using judgment and making this inst making, constantly making decisions, but getting uh, diverted by the fact that the phone's ringing or want to change the, whatever's on the radio, or the fact that you've just seen somebody walking down the street, or whatever it is whereas the autonomous vehicle is not distracted by any of that. But I think as, as users of vehicles, we will only look to trust that uh, AI that's built into the Google car or BMW's version of it or whatever, when we have, when we have seen it in action for some period of time. And I don't know whether that is going to be a month, six months or ten years before people will learn to trust the autonomous vehicle. I must say, I'm really looking forward to the day when I can get into an autonomous taxi in New York and it knows how to get to Brooklyn. Because, you know, you can't do that right now. You know? So getting, any further thoughts on getting people to, I suppose, trust, trust machines and, and let go of 
let go of certain decisions that, that one might wish people to let go of. I don't, yeah, I don't think we want to... Um, so I think, tr- I think in, in, in Peter's example, that's probably exactly the sort of time where we do need to trust. Um, but you actually used a word that wasn't in the question but is very related, which is bias. Mm. And I actually think this is one of the... You, know, you can ignore kind of paperclip machines for now, as I said, <laughs> but I think one thing that we should all worry about in terms of picking what values we want is whether the AIs that we're building actually just replicate the worst biases of us as people. I mean, you, I saw this terrifying article this week, apparently a research paper, um, where someone was using a, a deep neural network to try and assess from a person's face how likely they were to commit a crime. And it's like, well, there's nothing very um, profound in the knowledge that this AI has. It's just training on data from presumably pictures of criminals um, and non-criminals. Well, actually, you know, that might seem to be a very objective thing. You know, your point about you know, being trapped in systems, well, it's not a very objective thing. There are lots of biases built into the training data that come from humans. And so I think we just probably want to have a, as we start to hand over more and more trust to AIs, I think there is a political question, a values question about what are the human biases? Where is the data coming from that these models are trained on? There's nothing actually smart about them. They're not coming up with it themselves. They're coming from human-created data sets. And those biases could be very dangerous, very <laughs> ugly, and um, I don't think we have a good answer for how to deal with that yet. I think that links back to the question of design as well, that you know, the responsibility to design responsible systems and questions is still with human beings. Fantastic, and I think we probably have time for one last quick question. Um, okay, if we've been waiting, yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a, a request for practical advice um, on my everyday um, <coughs> task about getting things done. I work as a project manager in a research company, and we translate concepts or, or idea into data so that we can then bring that to the market. The biggest obstacle I find in my everyday job is the people who ask me to get things done that stops me from, stop me from getting things done. <laughs> and I was curious to know how you... So we've talked about bringing teams together. We've talked about designing and interacting and leadership and, and intelligence, artificial intelligence, all of this. But what happens when you're, it is your stakeholders that stop you? They've asked you for an idea. Your clients have asked you for a certain design. The government asks you to bring something together for... Um, this collaboration with your company or you have your uh, special elites that you want to, to bring into a successful uh, startup or, or a team of engineers um, that you want to bring to, to the nation a new, a new network of training. What happens when these stakeholders change their mind or they throw um, you know, new concepts or new ideas that stop you in your tracks? What do you do? Fantastic. So that's, that's a great... I think you've almost stolen uh, what was going to be my marvellous closing question to the panel, <laughs> uh, which is to, to give a piece of practical advice for people to take away into their lives, into their workplaces about getting things done. And so you sort of outline the scenario that I'm sure will be familiar to a lot of people, that you're asked to do things which are not at all the things you might wish to get done or need to get done. And so perhaps in reverse order from the start, beginning with Peter, I, I could invite our panel to give a bit of sort of take-home advice, sort of con- consolidating a thought to take, use, reflect upon. So in, in your, your case happens all the time. So the enemy, the biggest enemy of getting stuff done is change. You know, we can get stuff done providing we don't change things. And, and on any, any project, you can get it done quickly provided you don't change your mind. And it is, you know, the, the reasons why projects in this co- in country, infrastructure projects in, uh, in this country, uh, always go over budget or over time, it's because people want to change it. So, in your case, I would say, when people come and ask you to do, uh, do uh, what, what, I, what we do in our business is, if anybody wants to change, before you launch into doing that change, you tell them, we'll do it, but this is the impact of that change. Now, do you want me to do it or not? Do you want me to... Cost more or take longer, or do you want me to do it without changing it? So maybe the, the advice is uh, to, uh, whenever anybody asks you to do something extra or to change, to say, yeah, I will do it, but it means I won't do all this other stuff, or it will take me much, much, much longer. So the, uh, the enemy of getting stuff done is change. Thank you, Peter. Matt, Matt. 
Well, I wouldn't want to cast, cast a kind of aspersions on the management and leadership of your organisation <laughs> based, based on the question alone, but I, I think my observation, um, which maybe isn't immediately practical, but hopefully is, is um, you know, kind of over uh, a longer period of time, is I think one of the big problems that I see in a lot of organisations of different sizes is that generally smart people over time get to run things. And smart people also seem to assume that being a good manager correlates strongly with being smart. And if they are smart, then they'll become a good manager, you know, automatically. No, and work. I would say it seems to be the opposite of the yeah. case. I would say the very best managers I've ever met in any context have deliberately chosen that they're going to become good managers and they're going to learn how to do that in a very systematic and deliberate way. And I think until people do that... Um, they're bad managers, and I'm not saying that about your managers, I don't know them, but as <laughs> presumably you, you are either a manager yourself or you will be, um, so I suppose the best thing to make sure this doesn't happen to the people you manage is to deliberately set out to be a good manager, which is real work and not a natural uh, artefact of being clever. Yeah. Um, sounds very familiar what you're describing there. Um, I guess... Um, Something that works for me, um, and that has, uh, you know, become uh, initially something that I was doing out of desperation. At some point, <laughs> later on, became a method. Is um, is actually confrontation at the right moment in time, and I don't mean that in an aggressive way, um, which maybe in an Anglo-Saxon context is sometimes very hard to imagine. And being German sometimes incredibly helps with that. <laughs> <laughs> But um, to um, to be very very honest with the implications or, uh, or about the implications or about the consequences of what you're being asked for um, can be really helpful. And I've made the experience that sometimes people can be incredibly grateful for a no. If somebody tells them that what they're asking for is not possible and you can explain why, then that can actually drive things forward. And that can actually be a lot more productive than just trying to get it done. Fantastic. Thank you. Gosh. So I guess my summary would be: Life is short. Choose carefully what you want, what you're going to apply yourself to get to get done. I'd probably come back to, to Peter's thing. If you're um, if you're doing something that you think your stakeholders want, and then they come to you and they change their mind, they probably assume that there's no consequence to the to the change. That uh, there's there's perfectly elastic um, ability to deliver whatever is required, and they're understanding that that's not true, and that they. Uh, there is a, a trade-off between getting one thing done or getting another thing done uh, is, is key. And if they understand that, then there are choices to be made across the piece. So choose carefully what you choose to get done. Yeah. Thank you very much, Paul. Fantastic. Closing, closing thoughts. I've been scribbling tons of notes, which I'll take away and ponder. Uh, but I think we've had, we could go on talking for ages. Don't worry, we won't. Uh, but we could. I think it's been a great privilege to have such a sort of gamut of perspectives, people speaking so freely and so frankly about you know, this, this big topic and all its ramifications. And so I just want to end with a, few, with a few thank yous, really, to thank Quantum Black and the Royal Institution for having us here in this, in this astonishing room, which is, you know, do look at the, the pictures outside. If you haven't been here before, do soak up the environment. This is you know, a really privileged space to be, to be thinking and discussing and sharing ideas in. And of course, I'd like you to join with me in thanking our panels, Peter Chumley, Matt Clifford, Vera Moyaglan, and Paul J. Harris. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.